Harita, should we begin? Yes, yes, Junak. Yeah, I think we should begin. Yeah, we can start. Okay, I'd like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to all the participants to this workshop session of, of the conference. The theme is use of digital technology in math education. And as we know, there are many kinds of digital tools available for mathematics instruction. And these include uh, very sophisticated tools such as dynamic geometry software, computer algebra systems, spreadsheets, and which have you know, significantly impacted mathematics teaching and learning at the secondary, senior secondary school levels, or even at the tertiary level. There are also a plethora of apps available for uh, exploring various kinds of mathematical concepts. However, for in, uh, engaging young learners in the classroom, concrete manipulative materials have been used for decades. So manipulative materials such as Dean's blocks, place value tiles, abacus, counters, fraction bars, number grades, tangrams, polyminoes, and so many other things. Uh, they provide students an opportunity to work in the inactive mode. Uh, such materials provide concrete representations and embody the underlying structures of mathematical concepts. And they enable students to visualize, ex visualize explore, and even discover using a hands-on approach. However, like all resources, the use of manipulatives by themselves cannot lead to mathematical understanding and insight. For learning to be effective, it is imperative that students understand the relationship between these uh, materials and the concepts they represent. So manipulatives have to be integrated very carefully into the lessons. The online mode of learning, however, makes it difficult to integrate such concrete manipulatives in the teaching and learning of mathematics. The virtual counterparts of these manipulatives therefore present a great potential for learning and exploration and have special relevance in the present times when much of classroom uh, interaction is happening in the online world. So virtual manipulatives are great for inspiring creativity and teaching problem solving skills. In this workshop, we will explore many different examples from tessellations and algebra tiles to tangrams, pentominoes, prime factor circles, multiplication grids, Penrose tiles, number lines, dice, 3D polyhedra, and much more. Uh, the workshop will be presented by none other than Philip Legner, the creator of Polypad and the CEO of Mathigon.org. So it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Philip. Uh, may I just uh, take a second to share my screen? Is the screen visible? Yes, Yona. Yeah. So, uh, Philip is the founder and CEO of Mathibon.org, an award-winning platform for learning mathematics that is used by millions of students every year, all the year round. His goal is uh, to build the textbook of the future and to make mathematics learning more interactive, personalized, and engaging than ever before. Philip has uh, studied mathematics at the Cambridge University and mathematics education at the UCL Institute of Education. He has worked as a software engineer at Bloomberg, Google, and Wolfram Research. And may I also add and mention that during his school days, he has been a bronze, bronze medalist in the British Mathematics Olympiad and has won many accolades in various physics and astronomy uh, competitions. So it is really a pleasure to have you, Philip, and I'm really grateful that you could take out time to uh, conduct the session in this conference. Uh, so just to, uh, so uh, I think, uh, Philip, we will uh, spend about 70 minutes of this. This session is uh, about 90 minutes. So about 70 minutes will be for uh, the session and uh, followed by an interaction with the audience. Uh, we request the uh, participants to please post your doubts and queries on chat during the session. And we will take them up during the Q&A, but if there are any doubts specific to what is being shown at that moment, then we will try to answer your query right away. So thank you and over to you, Philip. I'll stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, the session today will be mostly focused on 
um, primary and secondary education, but hopefully there will be something interesting for everyone. And uh, I, I know that most of you will have used virtual or even physical uh, manipulatives um, before in the classroom with, uh, with students, but hopefully I can give you a few new interesting activities or lesson ideas, um, how you can use manipulatives to engage students to foster creativity and problem solving. And for all of these examples, we'll be using a platform called Polypad. And I put the link um, in the chat right now so that you can all um, sort of follow along uh, as, as I'm showing you some features. Um, Polypad is completely free to use. Um, you don't even need to create an account, but if you sign up, you can save your progress and, and share it with um, others as well. So I, I'll show you exactly how to do that um, uh, later. And Polypad is part of um, the company that I founded a few years ago called Mathigon. So if you go to mathigon.org, um, you can see many of the different projects um, that we have. Uh, Polypad are the virtual manipulatives, but there's much more to explore. And if we have uh, time towards the end of the session, maybe I can talk about some of the other um, projects as well. But for now, let's uh, click on Polypad here at the top and get started. So uh, Polypad is an open canvas for exploring, being creative and problem solving. And we have many different tools for all areas of mathematics to explore. So if I just click on some of the sections here in the sidebar, um, you can see all of the topics that are available. But let's start with polygons in geometry. And you can just click and drag those tools onto the canvas. You can also just click on them and they sort of appear in the center. The circular handle can be used to rotate them. All of the tiles snap together really nicely. You can click and drag to select multiple tiles like this. If I want to copy tiles, um, there's a copy button here. So I can click copy there and then rotate them around. You can see even the angles snap to ensure that um, tiles line up with nearby edges. Um, I can hold down the shift key on my keyboard. This is what I'm doing now and click tiles to add or remove them from the current selection. So this works very similar to other sort of graphics software or Photoshop, for example, if you've used that. And to make copying really easy, because this is something that you need to do all the time, you can just press the C key on your keyboard and that will create a copy. But um, the standard sort of control C, control V, of course, also works. Um, so uh, very quickly, I can create a little tessellation like this and then just copy this part uh, over and over again and, and create patterns like this in, in just a few seconds. Um, as I click and drag um, different tiles, you can see some buttons appear here at the bottom. And I'll talk more about these in a second. There are also lots of different tools. We've got the move tool, which I'm using at the moment. There are different pen tools. So I've got a, um, a normal pen, a bolder marker. I've got a highlighter that is kind of transparent. I've got a ruler if I want to draw straight lines. Um, I'll talk about some of the other tools in a second. And then here I've got a color picker. So I can change the color of my pen and you can see sort of the pens even change color. Or if I've selected some tiles on canvas, I can use the color picker to change the color of all of those tiles. And I can even sort of um, enter any RGB value or even make them transparent and, and sort of if they overlap each other, now they are, they are slightly transparent. Um, on if, if you have a trackpad um, on a laptop, for example, um, you can simply pan around with two fingers. It's kind of an infinite canvas if you need more space. We also have this pan tool that you can move the canvas and you can also pinch um, to zoom in and out. So I'm pinching on my trackpad right now, or you can use the buttons um, here in the sidebar um, if, if you don't have a trackpad. So uh, let's, let's use the sort of infinite canvas a little bit and uh, maybe create a Sierpinski triangle. So I can just really quickly select and copy tiles, use the C key on my keyboard to create a copy of the current selection. And uh, again, with uh, just a couple of clicks, um, create a Sierpinski triangle um, like that. Uh, here we go. And I think that's enough iterations for now. Um, cool. So here in the geometry sections, you can see we have regular polygons up to, I think, uh, 12 sided shapes. 
we have the standard pattern blocks of which you also might have physical tiles in, um, in your classroom. If you go to the settings menu here, uh, there's an option to alternate the tile colors. So some, some physical sets of tiles have a slightly different color scheme. And, and this is what you get if you sort of select this, uh, these alternate uh, tile colors. And I, I'll talk more about some of these other, other options uh, in a second as well. Um, we also have this special polygon, which I zoom in a little bit so that we can see what's going on, which is a custom polygon. So I can click on the vertices and make any irregular polygon that I want. If I click and drag on the, the edge, I can add new vertices like this. And if I just click on a vertex, it disappears if I want to remove it. So for example, students can make any kind of uh, quadrilateral that they like, like this. We can then click the fix vertices button so that now the vertices are locked in. I can't move them around anymore. And now we can try to create a tessellation using this custom quadrilateral. And maybe you know that every quadrilateral tessellates and uh, this is a really cool way for students to play around with that um, and, uh, and see if that is really true. And uh, all of these tiles should snap together really seamlessly to create tessellations like this. Um, let me open the chat panel so that I can see if there are any questions. Um, feel free to ask questions as I'm talking. And of course, you can follow along um, as, as I'm showing things. Um, open sort of a, a browser next to the Zoom window and, and try to uh, replicate some of, some of these things and, and let me know if you have any difficulties. Um, what I want to do about is talk a little bit more about some of these other actions that appear at the bottom here. So um, uh, we have a flip. Uh, yeah, I, I'll go a little bit slower. Um, I, I'll select just one of these tiles maybe, and I've got a flip action that um, just reflects them horizontally, uh, which uh, for most of these regular shapes doesn't make a difference, but for, for some of the other sort of uh, irregular polygons um, allows you to flip them over. I get back to the cut action in a second. We've already um, talked about the... Um, uh, can we paste this tile in my uh, PC? It means somewhere else from Polypad. I'm not quite sure what you mean. So if you want to copy tiles, um, I'll select it. We can click the copy button here, or you can just click the C key on your keyboard that copies it. Or you also can um, select um, one or more tiles and click um, Control or Command C on your keyboard to copy and then V um, uh, control or command V to paste sort of the standard syntax you have in, in all other applications again, and, um, and uh, it will uh, paste a copy of, of those tiles. Uh, you can delete tiles, or you can also just select them and press the backspace key on your keyboard. And then this gear icon are sort of more advanced options. And these are actually hidden by default you need to enable this advanced options checkbox in the settings panel um, uh, here in the sidebar. And then this little gear icon appears and that allows you to make tiles invisible or lock them or fix their position or make sure they always appear on top or behind all of the other tiles. Um, we won't actually need those for, um, for most of the session today. So I, I'll just hide this section. Um, let's talk a little bit about this cut tool here. So if I select cut, I can now draw a cut line and it will cut a tile in multiple different parts. Let's see uh, what this is useful for. So we can go to the grid settings uh, here, again, above, above the, the other settings, and maybe select um, the, the grid background like this. If this is quite faint, um, it should appear OK on most um, uh, most screens of a tablet or desktop, but if you're projecting polypad in a classroom, those lines might be quite faint. So you can go and enable the uh, high contrast mode, and that will make all of the grid lines a little bit darker, and it will also add black outlines around all of the other shapes. So this might be useful if you are uh, present projecting this in a classroom. And now we can use these grid lines and intersections, and you can see all of the vertices snap to those grid points. So it's really easy to create um, certain shapes that you want. For example, I can create a parallelogram like this. Um, 
I can fix the vertices. I've got a really nice parallelogram now. And we can think about how to calculate the area of a par parallelogram. So we can take the cut tool, cut off a triangle of, on, of one side, move it over to the other side, and we've got a rectangle. And we can really easily um, calculate the, um, uh, the area of that. But we can also do more complex things. So let's create um, a custom triangle. Um, you can cut, uh, yeah, you can definitely cut two uh, superimposed squares. So if I select both of those, I still have the cut tool. I can cut all of those together. And now they uh, are divided into four distinct uh, shapes. Let's put them back together. And you can see if I select more than one shape, there's also a join button that appears that allows me to join all of them back together into a single tile like this. Um, here I've created um, a, a little triangle and let's, uh, let's create some squares on each of the um, sides like this, for example. And let's copy this and create a one, two, three, one, two, three and one, two, three, a bigger square like this. Uh, we can lock all of these uh, or fix the vertices. Um, uh, so uh, let's try whether we can um, uh, prove Pythagoras' theorem. So uh, I'll use the cut tool and try to cut along a parallel line to the hypotenuse like this. And uh, I will select both of those shapes and select the cut tool again and try to cut a perpendicular line, um, kind of like this. And again, just snapping to the grid points. I will disable the grid background for now. Uh, let's make this a different color maybe to make it easier to compare. And now we can move this triangle over here, this triangle over here, put the square in the middle, this big shape over here, let's leave this, and this big shape over here. And uh, we've got another square on the hypotenuse. So um, students can play around with all of these sort of geometric relationships, uh, prove Pythagoras' theorem, and, and do all sorts of um, uh, other interactive things. And the, our, our vision be behind how we developed Polypad was really to make the learning as active as possible for students. So rather than just moving a slider somewhere and watching an animation, students can interact just as they would in the physical world, cut things, move things around. And this makes um, the experience much more concrete rather than watching a computer do something. Every step is something you doing something yourself, cutting things, moving tiles around and so on. Um, so yeah, let, I'm just checking my, um, uh, uh, my, list of uh, stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, one of the tools down here is the eraser tool, which might also be helpful if you have a sort of pen strokes, for example, you can go to the eraser and erase them, but you can also erase all other tiles if, uh, if you don't need them anymore um, as an alternative to just selecting them and, and clicking delete. Um, you, can, uh, you can also use um, the custom polygon for more complex tessellations. So let's try to make a tessellation using stars and let's use some of the other tools we have here um, uh, to help us create uh, this shape that we want. So I'll, I'll start maybe like this and then we can use the hexagon tool to help guide our, um, uh, our shapes like this. So we've got one corner of uh, a star here. Uh, we, we'll rotate this uh, shape and it should snap. We'll, oop, there we go. We'll create a new um, corner here and we can use the hexagon again for the next vertex. All of the vertices uh, really easily snap to each other. Now we can use the, uh, uh, the square again and rotate that a little bit. Oh, that wasn't quite far enough. Um, and snap that in here. And we we'll add one more vertex like this and use the hexagon again for one more shape like this. And uh, maybe you're kind of seeing where I'm going with this, but um, you can create all sorts of different um, other shapes um, using some of the polygons um, as, uh, as helpers or, or guiding blocks. And um, what else do we need? 
we need to rotate the square again like this and create our last vertex. And um, how should this look? The last vertex of the star is like this. So we've created a little star shape in here, uh, which we can lock. And now we have a reusable star we can use all over the place. And uh, maybe we can create little uh, tessellations like this uh, using those stars. So uh, lots of different things you can do um, with uh, uh, with um, the polygon tiles and the custom polygon and some of the other tools. Now, one, one other button that appeared down here um, that you might have seen is the, uh, we've talked about flip, we've talked about cut and join, is the fold net button. Now, if I click this now, I get a warning, this is not a valid polyhedron net. So let's, let's try to create the net of the polyhedron. So we have an hexagon, we kind of start like we did at the beginning, um, but we'll try to create the net of a prism. So I will um, create the sides of the prism and then the top of the prism like this. I select all of those shapes, I click fold net and it will fold this into a three dimensional shape and I can just click and rotate and uh, I have um, a three dimensional shape. Um, as I selected, you can see here, there are a few different options. I also have a different handle for moving this around because if I just click and drag on a shape, um, it sort of rotates it in three dimensional shape uh, space. Um, I have this slider down here to unfold a shape. I can also have it sort of in this uh, partially folded state and look around. I can also click unfold and it will sort of break it back apart into individual faces. And um, if, if we collapse this section and go to the uh, 3D solid section here, this is actually something we added um, very recently. You can see we have built in um, shapes uh, for uh, support for many different shapes. So I can add a dodecahedron. I can unfold that and, and see what it looks like. I have my icosahedron and all other um, platonic solids. I can create any net I want using the polygons I have up, um, up here, sort of pyramids, prisms, other platonic solids or, or other polyhedra. Uh, so let's see if, if I can create net of a cube, um, maybe like this. And I'll select all of them and fold net. And uh, I've got a little three-dimensional cube. Let's unfold them again. Let's put this shape over here. Now it's no longer a valid net. So let's see what happens. You can see it still folds, but it's no longer a cube and students can sort of uh, look around and see what went wrong and, and how they need to change their net. Um, if I have something like this and try to click fold net, it will give me a warning because you have these sort of four faces meeting at a vertex and there's no way to fold this. So uh, lots of other things you can do with 3D solids. Um, I just interrupt uh, briefly, uh, Philip. There was a question where uh, can we write on it using a pen tablet? So can we write on the screen? Yeah, um, go to the uh, pen tool here, select uh, what pen you want, select the color you want, and you can write with a mouse on screen, you can write with a finger on a tablet, or you can also write with a stylus on a tablet. All of that should work. And, and um, it yes, it will be uh, copied into another document or in any other. Uh, yeah, so you can just take a screenshot um, of what's on the screen and then you have an image and you can use that. You can also click this button here in the sidebar and that will download a PNG image of, um, of the entire, um, uh, entire polypad. So if I um, open this, uh, uh, you can't see that because it's a different window, but it, it'll download a PNG version of, um, of uh, exactly what's on the canvas right now. Um, any other questions that I, I missed? So one thing I wanted to share is that um, so far we've just been working on our own in um, on, on a sort of a canvas. Uh, uh, let's maybe zoom out a little bit and see everything else that we have on here. Um, if you click on the file menu here in the sidebar, right now we've always been in the tiles tab, um, but uh, if you go to the file menu, you can save your work. And to do that, you need to be signed into Mathigon account. You can just, um, uh, I am already signed in, but it just takes a couple of clicks. You can authenticate with Google or Facebook or Microsoft. Um, then go to the file menu, give it a name. So uh, Zoom 
a demo maybe and click save and it will save your work um, to your library. And you can see here, I already have lots of canvases saved uh, to my library and now Zoom demo is, um, is on here as well. Um, I can duplicate it, I can delete it, I can create a folder and, and sort of move this file into one of the folders if I want to organize it. So let's move this into demo canvases. Maybe it's here now, you can see I have lots of other demo canvases here as well uh, that we can uh, sort of look at later or, or see uh, what's going on there. Um, let's go back to this uh, Zoom demo. Um, I, um, I've got a unique URL I can copy and share with other people. In fact, I can put this in the chat panel right now. Um, if, if you want to click on, on that and, and open this file, I can prevent sharing. So if you don't want, um, if you, you don't want um, other people to be able to access that canvas, um, you, you, you don't have to share the URL, but you can also prevent sharing or enable sharing like that. You can, um, if you have set up classes with students within Mathigon, and we can talk more about that later, you can set it so that only your students can access a document. And um, if you click the sharing link, you can also share it directly to social media or to Google Classroom, or you can embed it as an iframe on other websites and you can customize exactly what tiles um, you want students to have access to or what features you want to be visible and then just copy this iframe link and you can embed that, sorry, on, um, on your personal blog. Um, so this is how the sharing works. Um, we have your personal library here, um, uh, it, uh, and uh, if you scroll a bit further down, we also have lots of example um, canvases. And uh, because we were just talking about 3D solids, we have an example canvas here with all the Archimedean solids pre-built, and you can sort of um, uh, look at them, you can unfold them and look at their nets. Um, and uh, yeah, this might be just a... a, a a nice resource if, if you're looking for certain uh, Archimedean solids or more, more complex uh, three-dimensional nets um, uh, to create. So um, there were some questions about writing on the canvas, I yeah. think. Uh, you can see here, there is some text on the canvas already, the labels for, um, for those platonic solids. Um, of course, you can just write using the pen tool um, on the canvas uh, uh, like this, and you can write, uh, 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 low, here we go. So uh, hopefully that's much easier if you have a stylus or are on a tablet. But there's also this text box tool down here and you can click a text box anywhere and um, here is some text. Uh, you can uh, select parts and make them bold or change the color or change the size or change the size um, of the uh, entire text. So um, all of the uh, rich text editing um, and, uh, and, and that sort of stuff should be um, supported. And if you download the content as an image, it will just, uh, sorry, it will um, just be a PNG. Um, so yeah, we've talked a little bit about the 3D solids. We've talked about the examples and I'll um, show, um, uh, uh, we'll, I, I'll show some of the other example canvases uh, here later as well. Um, you can save a canvas, you can create new folders or new canvases uh, using those, um, those, uh, those buttons. And um, towards the end, I'll talk a little bit more about the class menu and how you can set up classes within, uh, within Mathigon and assign a canvas to a class. Uh, but for now, let's uh, have a look at some of the other topics. So we've been talking a lot about um, about geometry and, and these poly, uh, polygons, but let's let's go to a blank new canvas and see what else is um, out here. So we have uh, pentominoes and tetrominoes. And again, you can just click and drag them onto the canvas. They work just like normal polygons. You can change the colors, you can flip them, you can uh, join them together if you want, um, just like uh, normal other polygons and tetrominoes as well. We have uh, tangram shapes and we have sort of the classic um, tangram using triangles and, and quadrilaterals. And you can make all sorts of different shapes here. Uh, one thing that's really cool for students to do is to create um, their own shape using, uh, using tangram. Uh, maybe something uh, like this and which shape am I missing? Select all of the shapes 
join them together. They've got one, uh, one continuous block like this. They'll save it to your li their library and share it with all of their classmates and, and friends. And then um, their friends have to actually work out how this shape was made and, and use the original um, tangram shapes to sort of uh, reverse engineer how, uh, how this shape was created. So students can create their own tangram activities. If you click this little link here next to the label, we also have a library just with lots of different uh, tangram shapes and puzzles. So if you want to create an elephant, for example, uh, we've got a pre-built elephant here and already have all of the tangram shapes on the canvas and, and students have to work out um, how, hmm, how was this created? Maybe one triangle like this and uh, one triangle like this and sort of can try to uh, piece together how, um, how those uh, pre-built shapes were created. Um, we also have a different kind of tangram, which is kind of called this magic egg, um, where you can have uh, even more uh, shapes. So um, what's a good example uh, that we can make? So uh, I think maybe something like this. Uh, and we'll put this shape up here, kind of in here. Let's delete all of this. Um, um, this triangle might go in here. That didn't quite fit, kind of like this. We put one of these little um, arcs in here. Let's rotate this a little bit more maybe. Let's uh, flip this shape over like this and align it like this. Uh, which pieces are missing? So we'll uh, this one here. Uh, we'll put one of the triangles at the bottom. And are those all of the shapes? And then we've kind of created a little uh, chicken or bird or something like that uh, using uh, using these uh, magic. Oh, we're missing uh, this one. Ah, this should go in here, I think, kind of be the beak of the bird. And then this is uh, the head, something like this. So, um, uh, and, and there are lots of other types of uh, shapes you can also do with this, um, with this other form of um, tangra. Uh, we have Penrose tiles, uh, which I won't go into too much detail, but they are other types of polygons um, that, uh, that create irregular um, tessellations. And when connecting them, you have to make sure that the lines or the, the arcs drawn on the surface of those shapes always uh, line up correctly, so kind of like this. And any, any pattern you create will never repeat. It's, it's sort of irregular. And there's also a slightly different take on Penrose tiles using these nature-themed um, um, tiles that you can also fit together in, in lots of different ways. Uh, maybe uh, this could go in here. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, and, and again, this is an irregular um, tessellation. We have pentagon-based tessellations. So uh, the normal regular pentagons we have here don't tessellate, as uh, you all know. And this might be an interesting uh, thing for students to play around with and see uh, whether or not they can make tess pentagons tessellate. Or you can join them together. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I meant you can fold a net and look at sort of a vertex of a dodecahedron like this. But there are actually some pentagons that do tessellate. Uh, for example, uh, these prismatic tiles, uh, we can tessellate uh, kind of like this. Uh, and in fact, there are 15 different types of pentagons that tessellate. The last one was only discovered a few years ago. So this is almost still an area of active uh, research. The proof that those are all of the shapes was also just a few years ago. Um, and, and students can try to find tessellations using these uh, irregular pentagons. So um, we can fit uh, those ones together uh, like this maybe, and we've got a little octagon now, and we can then put the octagons together like this and put one in here maybe, um, and, and sort of create tessellations like this. And, and all of these, um, these 15 pentagons we have here tessellate, these are the only 15 uh, pentagons or, or sort of kinds of pentagons that tessellate. And for some of them, it can actually be very tricky to, um, to figure out how, how to put them together. 
I've already talked about um, the 3D solids. We have some measuring tools. So if you want to calculate the internal angle of, uh, let's, let's get to Pentagon again, um, calculate the internal angle, we can use the, um, where were we, measuring tools. Um, we can use the protractor and we can sort of move them around, resize them and work out what, um, what the uh, internal angle of, um, of the Pentagon is. We can also use the ruler um, uh, to, um, to measure distances. And again, the, the, the sort of handles snap to existing vertices or the grid and so on. Um, to make it really easy to interact with all of those tiles. Uh, you can upload images. So there's an upload image button here. If you, um, if you have a sort of real life image of a, a house, for example, and then you want to use the tools to measure distances um, on, uh, on, on the image, all of that should be possible. And we have many other sort of um, geometry uh, tools as well. We have tantric tiles that you have to um, it, it's a kind of game you have to put them together and make sure that um, the uh, the uh, sort of uh, shapes drawn on the tiles link up uh, correctly like this. Um, and and there are several games you can play using that. We have some fractals you can uh, fit together in uh, really interesting ways. Uh, we have column tiles, which uh, some of you might be um, familiar with because this is actually a uh, um, Sort of pattern or tradition from India, um, where uh, where you draw these uh, interesting shapes using rice or flour um, on the ground, and you can create different colon patterns uh, like this by by fitting those tiles together. So lots of different sort of uh, ways to explore, be creative, and and create different uh, types of artworks using all of the different geometry tools. Now I see there have been quite a few questions in the chat that I'll get to later. So we will talk more about probability and graphing and all of that. So maybe hold on uh, to all of those questions um, until the end, because I will get to man many of them later. And the session is being recorded, I think, and I'm sure the organizers will, will share the link later. Okay, so let's, let's refresh the page. Uh, start with, a, um, with an empty canvas and move to the next section about numbers. Actually, before I do that, if you have any more questions about these geometry tools, you can click this question mark link and we have a tutorial page um, with uh, many more details for all of the different geometry tiles and little video clips and recordings and how you can use them and some pre-built canvases. So let's just open those up and take a look. Um, so we've got a fractal created using the fractal tiles. We've got a larger tantrix pattern. We've got uh, more interesting column uh, patterns. We've got these nature tiles, um, uh, nature Penrose tiles, and the the more traditional um, Penrose tiles using the kite and um, and uh, arrow tiles. Um, so lots of different uh, things you can do with all of these geometry shapes. And click on the question mark if you want to find out more but I'm going to talk more about numbers now. So this is maybe for slightly younger students um, in primary school. And we'll start with these number tiles here. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's drag some of those tiles out onto the canvas. Here we've got a bar of 10 squares and we'll have a second one of those and we'll have uh, four, um, four smaller single squares like this. And I will select all of these. Now you can see there are different options compared to the polygons before. So these buttons that appear floating above the toolbar are dynamic depending on what you currently have selected. So I can select all of these and merge them together. And now I have one big block of, uh, made up of 24 squares. And I've got a handle here. I can move around to change the width of those squares. And this is a really cool way for students to explore divisibility and factors and, um, and, uh, and remainders or prime numbers. So for 24, for example, we can work out how to make them into a rectangles. We can have one times 24, let's make a copy, or we can have two times 12, or we can have um, three times eight, or we can have four times six, and uh, really quickly, we can find all of the factors um, and, and prime factors of, of a number like this by playing around with these, um, these tiles. 
we can also, um, let's delete those. Um, once we have a block like this, split it up into lots of individual shapes. I can move around. Let's delete one of them and merge the other ones back together. Um, now we have 23 numbers and now we can uh, see if we can make this into a rectangle. Uh, this doesn't quite work, this also not. Hmm, it doesn't seem like there's a way to make 23 tiles into a rectangle except one long row or one long column. And hopefully students can sort of very playfully discover prime numbers on their own, um, just like that. Um, uh, we have sort of 100 um, together. Again, you can split them up. You can delete them if we only want 80 maybe and merge the others back together. You can change the color of the tiles like before. And, and hopefully this, um, all of these are really intuitive and seamless to use. You can rotate them um, and, and whatever you want to do with that. Uh, we have number bars and number frames. Again, these are sort of relatively standard tiles. Uh, maybe you know them as Cousinair rods, so we can uh, use them as, uh, actually this is nine, as sort of um, uh, utilities for finding the width and height of some of the other tile types, or we can uh, rotate them and play around with them in all sorts of different ways. Um, again, this might not be the standard color scheme you're familiar with, it's the same button we looked at before, alternate tile colors, colors switches to the, um, uh, maybe uh, the, the color scheme you have for physical bars like this. Um, we can uh, also use these, um, these number frames and put them together and talk about simple addition and, and sort of base 10 blocks and so on. Uh, number cards are very simple. They are just sort of tiles with a number on them. Um, you can make any number you want really, Let's have 100. You can also have negative numbers like minus 100 and uh, negative numbers by default um, are red. But like with all of the tiles, you can really easily change the color to what you want. Um, what's cool about these numbers is that you can drop them onto each other and you can see the um, there's sort of a nice hover effect and it adds them up. So 100 plus 8, 108, I can subtract 10. So you can use this for simple addition. I won't go into more detail just now, but we come back to these numbers because they are really useful in combination with some of the other tiles we have. Uh, we were already talking a little bit about prime numbers when, when trying to factor 23. In fact, we have an entire section just about these prime number circles. And here you can see every number has sort of some colors in a circle around them. Um, and every prime number has a different color. So two is yellow, three is green, five is blue, seven is purple, all larger prime numbers are 11. And for composite numbers, um, uh, they have multiple colors. So 10, for example, is two times 10, or 12 is two times two times three. I can type in larger numbers like 48, for example, 48 is three times two times two times two times two or I can type in 2021, and, uh, which is the product of two prime factors, as, um, as you can see here. We don't know what those are um, just now. Uh, what's really cool is I can click on just one segment in the circumference, pull them apart like this. So 2021 is 43 times 47. And then I can also drop them onto each other just like this to multiply. And this works with all of the types. So 10 is two times five, 12 is two times six, and six is three times two. And I can multiply all of these numbers again um, to, uh, to sort of uh, see what happens. So a really cool way uh, for students to play with prime numbers and prime factors, uh, work out the lowest common multiple or greatest common divisor of say 14 and 10, for example, by looking at which shapes appear, uh, which colors appear in both circles or which colors appear in at least one of the circles. Um, really cool, um, very basic number theory, but up to much more advanced topics, even in college level number theory um, that can be done with those, um, with those prime factor circles. A slightly different visualization of numbers are these dot arrangements. They work in a similar way. We sort of have a yellow two, uh, a green, um, green three, a red, uh, a blue five, um, a purple seven, and so on. Um, but rather than just showing the prime factors, they are sort of grouped. So 12, for example, is grouped as two groups of two groups of three. 
and uh, nine is three groups of three, seven is a prime number and just a single circle, 14 is two groups of seven. And like before, I can click on sort of these sub-circles and pull them apart or drop them onto each other um, again to uh, sort of play around with that. You can also, uh, as you can see, as I select this tile, some other buttons appear here at the bottom. I can reorder them if I depend on how I want um, the, the factors to be ordered. I can join some of the factors so I can have two groups of six, for example, or I can have um, maybe three groups of four. So lots of other ways to play around with these dot arrangements. Um, yes, Mathigon is completely free to use. Um, uh, just go to the website and play around with it. And yes, we'll share recordings after the presentation. I think I have to speed up a little bit because uh, there's still a lot more stuff to get to. So um, we have number grids. We have the sort of standard addition or multiplication grids. You can move the handles to change the, uh, the width and height. Um, we also have a sort of standard um, 10 by 10 grid. And again, you can change the, the dimensions um, of, of what you want. I can double click on a number select all of the multiples and then highlight them in a different color, double click on the three, select all of the multiples, uh, highlight all of those, and maybe do some sieve of Eratosthenes here to find all of the prime numbers up to 100 or look at di how different patterns are distributed uh, for, um, for different, uh, different numbers. Or we can take a look at this multiplication grid. And in fact, let's enable the grid background for this again. So here you can see I'm sort of showing a multiplication problem of 23 times 12 along the horizontal and vertical axis. And students can use this to, um, to find the product. And like before, I can move those handles to show different problems. You can also use this um, for decimal numbers. So this could be 2.3 times 1.4 maybe, uh, um, and, and use this as a way to multiply decimal numbers. And you can also move this um, handle here in the middle to change the base. So we can do the whole thing in base eight, for example. Now the big yellow squares are eight by eight wide and, um, and use this as a tool for, um, for multiplication. And there are many other numbers tools like before we've gotten Abacus um, that you can use and you can sort of create a, a multiple of those depending on exactly what you need. Um, uh, exploding dots is maybe something you're familiar with. This is a way to visualize place value where sort of one dot in the 10 square becomes 10 dots in the one square. Bucket of zero is, is another sort of uh, visualization to think about uh, a negative number. So right now I've got a bucket with lots of one and minus one pairs. If I take minus one out, the overall value becomes positive. Uh, if I take one out, the overall value becomes zero again and so on. I won't go into much more detail here, but again, if you click the question mark icon next to the number section, uh, you will have uh, lots of uh, other tutorial videos and more detailed explanations for all of these different tile types. Uh, let's move on to the fraction sections and uh, again, start with uh, an em empty canvas maybe. Um, we have fraction bars um, that again, work like standard fraction bars you are probably familiar with. You can change the colors, you can split them up into individual tiles or merge them together. Just a couple of features I wanted to point out. We have this additional handle here to just partially highlight one of these fraction bars. Um, like this, for example, you can still change the color to uh, something else what you want, um, but um, this sort of partially highlights a fraction bar. Um, you have, uh, you can split them up and merge them together. I showed this before. We have these additional buttons to rename fraction bars. So I can, I have sort of three thirds here. I can make them four quarters or five fifths and sort of split them up into um, much smaller bars or join them back together. Right now it sort of just um, goes up, uh, the, the denominator increases by one, but let's have a look at something more interesting. Let's partially highlight so that we have two thirds. Now, if we split them up, um, it finds the next denominator that sort of fits into what I currently have selected uh, like this. Um, this can be really useful for um, exploring addition, for example. So if we want um, two thirds plus one half, we can put those tiles next to each other and we can use these rename tools and students can try to find a value that sort of 
um, appears in both of them uh, in order to be able to add those fractions. Um, I already showed you how to merge tiles, but just one really fun element that we've added um, is that if they are different colors, let's make uh, some of them red and some of them uh, uh, yellow maybe. Um, I'm not sure what's a good example. Maybe a slightly more red, red like this. Um, if, you, uh, if you merge them together, they interpolate their colors. So if I merge them, they become orange. So this is a cool way to think about color mixing problems or, or, um, or, or yeah, color ratios as well. And we also have fraction circles that kind of work in the same way. You can uh, fit them together really easily and rotate them around each other uh, just uh, like that. Okay, um, again, any questions about what else you can do on Polypad, we'll probably get to uh, a little bit later in the presentation and we will share recording after, um, uh, afterwards. Um, we have algebra tiles, which again, I'm going to skip over because um, you're probably very familiar with those already. They are a very standard tool um, in, uh, in, in most uh, sort of, uh, software environments. We have X and Y tiles and X, Y tiles. We also have negative tiles. If you put them on top of each other, they automatically cancel out uh, like this um, if, if they're close enough, which can be a great way to sort of um, solve uh, quadratic equations or talk about completing the square and so on. And we also have this balance scale, which works with all of the other tiles we've talked about before. So I could put, uh, for example, um, 10, Let's make this a little bit smaller on one side and I can put two on here as well. And then I could put X maybe on the other side and I can balance this and we'll solve the equation. And now I've got a little equation I can solve um, X equals 12, for example. Uh, we have also lots of, where was I? Lots of other weights I can put on one side or the other. So actually this wasn't a particularly interesting example. So uh, let's try again. Let's maybe have uh, two X on one side and let's use the number cards, which I mentioned before. Ha how about two X plus five uh, equals 11, kind of like this. Let's uh, balance the scale so that we assign the correct value to X. Um, now, now we have an equation like this and now let's try to solve it. So let's make a minus five, a minus five tile and create two copies of that. Let's drop a minus five onto the number here. You can see it's no longer balanced, but if I drop a minus five onto the other side as well, it is balanced. And I can delete the zero and nothing happens. And now we have two X equals six, which means that one X should equal three. And students can in a very visual way solve equations like this. It works with all of the other tiles. If you want to use a prime factor circle on one side, you can do that. If you want to use X squared on the other side, we can solve quadratic equations as well. All of that should be possible. Now, one thing I never expected teachers to do, but which has been really popular, is to use the balance scale with our probability tools, which is the next section here. So let's put some dice on one side of the equation. I have some um, three dice here. Um, and if you select the dice, one new button appears at the bottom, which is uh, randomized. So I can click randomize. It rolls all of the three dice. And suddenly I've got a little addition problem. And uh, maybe we can use the, um, the number bars here to solve this addition problem. So six plus one plus four, I think is 11 like this. And I balance the equation. And now students can roll the dice again and you get a new addition problem. And the answer happens to be 11 again. Uh, that was a coincidence. Six plus three plus one is 10. Uh, so another addition problem. So very quickly, students can use these dice we have to create their own simple arithmetic problems. Um, we also have some other... Sorry, uh, is there a way of dividing both sides on the balance too? Like uh, we don't have a button that does that automatically. Students would have to manually um, add sort of... Uh, the, the correct amount or, or delete some of the tiles to do that. Um, for example, if you just have an X bar on one side, there's no way to, to break that, that up into a half X. Um, so that's not possible at the moment. Um, 
uh, we, um, I've talked about the dice. We have some other probability tools uh, like coins that work kind of in the same way, but just with two sides like this. We have um, spinners and we have two different types of spinners. These uh, uniform ones uh, where you just um, decide how many um, regions you want and then you can click the arrow or click randomize um, to, to change those. And again, you can change the color uh, to anything you want. Or we have, um, actually, I want a custom spinner like this, um, where like with the custom polygon, you can just click to add new regions or move them around to create any custom uh, spinner that you want. Uh, these tools are great for generating random data. In fact, um, if we go to the examples here, we have some pre-built canvases, for example, just 100 dice on a canvas like this. And you can select all of them, roll all of them uh, together um, and uh, sort of generate really quickly generate random data and students see actively that it's random, not that they're sort of just a computer program as a black box and they can't tell uh, what to do with it. So this works for young students just introducing probability. But one really cool lesson idea using these dice is around um, exponential decay, something that happens much later in school, sort of um, towards the end of high school maybe. And that is imagine that each of these dice is an atom in a radioactive block of material, maybe um, uranium in a nuclear power station or for carbon dating a little bit um, of cloth of a mummy or fossil. And every time you roll a six, the radioactive atom decays. So we select all of the sixes, uh, two more here and a few more here, and uh, we delete them. And then we select all of the remaining dice, click randomize again, and uh, sort of do the same thing again. Every time we roll a six, it's a radioactive atom that decays. So we delete them and we are left with uh, um, some fewer dice. And the question, of course, for students is, how often do I have to repeat this process until no dice are left anymore? And um, there's some really interesting probability, uh, law of large numbers, uh, normal distribution, radioactive decay, exponential functions, some very advanced mathematics here. And um, yeah, students can make a prediction. Students can generate some random data by repeating this. And actually for, for these 100 dice, I think it takes over 20 times on average until all of them are gone. So um, yeah, some very unexpected results as well, maybe regarding how long it takes for radioactive materials to decay. Um, some other probability tools, uh, we have playing cards and you can sort of drag them onto the canvas, stack them on top of each other, have an entire deck, double click to draw a card and turn that over. You can um, shuffle uh, the cards if you want and sort of change the suit, uh, lots of other things here. Uh, we have polyhedral dice. Um, so if you don't want just uh, random numbers up to six, you can use these polyhedral dice and randomize these as well and get random numbers up to 20 or 12 or six. Um, we have non-transitive dice. Maybe you're familiar with those. I won't go into more detail, but there's some really interesting mathematics here. And you can see they are normal six-sided dice, but have very special labels. So this die, for example, has lots of threes. And then some sides have uh, um, seven, uh, actually eight. Um, wonder if we can get an example here. Um, Maybe we need a few more. There we go. We have uh, eight, um, eight dots on one side and there's some interesting mathematics. We have standard dominoes um, that uh, you can play around with. And one section I want to dive into a little bit more detail that's also something we added very recently is charts and statistics. So we can create a table on the canvas. Let's add some data, um, A, B, C, um, two, four, one. And let's add uh, maybe two more columns, um, four to one, uh, five, three, two. So I've created a table. Let's drag one of these charts on, onto the canvas. And now if I select the table, you can see there's this little blue handle here, which allows me to link a table to a chart and it displays the data. And if I change this four to two, you can see the, the chart updates immediately. And if I select the chart, I have lots of other options here. I can make it a road chart, a line chart, an area chart. Um, I can say whether it's sort of on top of each other or stacked or as a percentage. And all of these um, tools kind of work with each other. Um, this is 
sort of normal table editing software. I can select multiple cells. I can copy and paste data from Excel or um, Google Sheets. If I have an existing data set I want to use, I can sort of resize the table however I want. Uh, we have pie charts and donut charts. Maybe the box and whiskers plot is an interesting one. We need um, just uh, categorical data uh, for that. So, uh, sorry, uh, numeric data for that. So let's collect, collect it to the box, box and whiskers plot and it might make sense to have a few more items um, four, four, two, uh, five, seven, two, uh, one, two, four. So I've, I've created my box and whiskers plot ZW to add the labels. Um, let's uh, maybe make this 100. You can see uh, there's sort of a, a very long arm. We can make this a little bit bigger again. Maybe maybe just 30 is enough to, to illustrate the concept. And you can toggle outliers to see whether you want sort of numbers very far away from the mean to be represented as little dots and outliers or, um, or as, as part of this box and whiskers plot. And, and we'll be adding many more different chart types and, and features here in, um, in the next few weeks. And again, click the question mark if, if you have additional questions about, about those tools. Um, and uh, yeah, we've always almost arrived at the, the last section here in the sidebar tools and axes. So we have some um, additional tools like a number line, for example. If you select that, you can see here, we have lots of options. You can change um, the start, maybe make that 100. Step size can be 10. Uh, we can change the width of the tiles. We can add some subdivisions and create any type of number line you want. And again, this works really well with all of the other tools we have developed. So um, let's make um, the width a bit narrower, for example, like this. So we can use this together with the number bars on top here. Um, this works really well. We can use it together with the fraction bars. So if we make this um, step size one and 10 subdivisions, now I can use this with our um, fraction bars. Actually, uh, it's still not quite the right scale, maybe something like this. Um, so, and, and we'll start at zero. So I've got um, a one here or, and I can have thirds on it or something like that. So these number lines are really useful and work with all of the, uh, the other tools. Uh, we also have an entire coordinate system. Um, uh, here we go. And again, you can change the axis depending on what you want. You can uh, resize them. You can have multiple coordinate systems on the same canvas showing things. And uh, you can use the other tools I've shown you so far but let's get to some of the other buttons down here. So for example, we have construction tools, uh, line and circle. I can construct a line. Um, I can do that anywhere, but on, on the coordinate system is a nice way to do that. Um, I can construct a triangle, for example, like this. And this is dynamic geometry. So I can move, um, I can move the tools around um, and, and it updates. I can select a line and draw the perpendicular bisector, for example, let's draw all of those for, for my triangle here and let's make those a different color maybe. And uh, wow, they all meet in a single point as I, as I move those tiles around. And let's go back to the construction tools and draw the circumcircle of the triangle like this and make this uh, blue maybe. So lots of dynamic geometry you can do on a blank canvas or as part of this coordinate system, you can if I sort of select a triangle, for example, I can draw the in circle as well. Um, I can draw tangent lines um, to existing lines. I can select a circle and see its current area or radius or circumference. In the same for a line, I can see the length and I can construct a perpendicular line through a point or stuff like that. Um, one other thing I can do with coordinate systems is function plotting. So uh, we've talked about most of these tools. Now the textbook I think I mentioned is um, here is a coordinate system uh, is just some plain text, uh, but we also have an equation editor. So I can type in y equals x squared. Let's also make this a little bit bigger. And like with the tables, I've, this, I've got this connection handle and I can connect this equation to the coordinate system and it draws the function. Or I can have an implicit equation like um, 
x squared over five plus y squared over eight equals one. And predictions in the chat, what this is going to look like if I draw this on a coordinate system, it's an ellipse or I can have, a, um, uh, let's actually just uh, start from scratch. Uh, R equals, uh, maybe let's do a three sine um, theta over four and make this uh, green. And this draws uh, a spiral equation. And actually, I, I think what I actually wanted to do is four theta uh, and that draws a um, uh, uh, flower like this. Um, so um, in this equation editor, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can do fractions, powers, square roots. You can use the buttons we have at the bottom, or you can just um, sort of type slash on the screen for a fraction. You can type SQRT for square roots. You can type alpha for Greek letters. All of that um, should be supported. So yeah, we have equation editors and you can use them with the coordinate system, but you can also just use them as normal text um, on the canvas. Um, we've already seen the, uh, the tables. Uh, we see uh, we have clocks and we have sort of live clocks or we have geared clocks where you can um, change uh, the current time uh, and even completely free moving clocks that don't necessarily make sense where you can move the, the handles independently. Um, using the question builder um, component, you can add um, question fields on the canvas that students uh, have to answer. So you can use this to create entire worksheets. You can add some text, some manipulatives, add some question fields for students, type in the correct answers, and then save this to your library, assign it to one of your classes, and then um, uh, students can answer those and they are automatically graded and you can sort of download a spreadsheet that shows um, the work of all of the students and how many questions they have uh, completed correctly. I don't think I will have time to go into much more detail there, but um, what I wanted to show is um, if you go to the, um, uh, we have a tutorials link down here, um, but if you go to the four teachers section and I, I discard all of those changes, we have many more research, uh, resources that I think you will find very interesting. So events and webinars, we host very regular events. You can browse recordings of all of our uh, previous webinars uh, where we've talked to maybe an hour just on how we can use Polypad for probability or an hour just about geometry. Lots of different webinar recordings that you can watch, they're all free to use. Um, you also have lots of upcoming events um, uh, and you can go to Eventbrite and register those. Some are with guest speakers. We've got an event on data science with Polypad or algebra. All of these events are completely free to use. Um, they will be recorded. Uh, they're live on YouTube and you can watch them later. Um, so take a look at those events. Uh, we also have some tutorial videos. So we have a tutorial on how you can set up classes within Mathigon and add students. We have a tutorial how you can share a Polypad Canvas to Google Classroom, how you can use the question builder tool I, I just mentioned before and set up worksheets for students and assign it to, to classes and, and then see students' responses. So if you have more questions, watch all of those tutorials. Um, we have an entire library with lots of different Polypad lesson plans. Let me just make the window a little bit bigger. Um, so we, I think we have uh, more than a hundred different lesson plans now and tutorials um, for all sorts of different topics um, from primary school up to uh, high school. Uh, you can sort of filter by what you're interested in. Let's search for a geometry lesson plan. Uh, we've got a, um, a lesson plan, plan on pentomino perimeters and how you can use pentominoes to, um, to teach about area and perimeter of, of different geometric shapes. Or we have uh, some tangram puzzles and uh, sort of explains how to use the tangram uh, tiles and students can create their own uh, puzzles and share them with other students and sort of embedded videos um, to, to help you get started. So lots of lesson plans and um, activities here to play around with other tutorials and so on. And uh, if I go back to for teachers, the last tab uh, is uh, we just launched a community forum for teachers. So you can create an account here. You can ask questions. You can connect with other teachers. You can share some of the work um, uh, we have uh, done. Um, all of that is possible. Uh, there's a question about 
offline support. So um, if you scroll to the very bottom, uh, there should be a link to mobile apps. So mathigon.org slash apps. We have um, apps for iOS and Android. They should work on all devices, smartphones, tablets, um, anything really. And they were completely offline. So they have our interactive courses, but they also have a version of Polypad on there that works offline if, uh, if you don't have an internet connection. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that means it's, it's time for the proper Q&A now. So um, yeah, if, if there's anything... Uh, any questions you have that I haven't covered yet or any, um, any, any parts that I went too, too fast, maybe um, now is your chance. Uh, put yeah. your, your questions in the chat and I'll try to answer those. Uh, so I just, uh, uh, you've answered most of the questions, Philip. Uh, only one or two, which I see. So th there's some specific questions. So for example, is it possible to superimpose two shapes and then cut? You showed the cutting feature. Uh, yeah, well, uh, let's try that again. I've, I've got a, um, uh, an, an octagon. I put a hexagon on top. I can maybe use the transparency sliders to make the hexagon transparent if I really want to see multiple shapes on top of each other. Um, I select both of them. I'll cut them. And both of those shapes have individually been cut, um, kind of like this. Okay. Okay, so there was also a question about, can we name the vertices in a 3D, uh, in a polyhedron, basically? Um, there's no automated way to do that. So let's, um, let's take one of those 3D solids, maybe a dodecahedron. Um, we can un unroll that uh, kind of like this. We can also make um, sort of, it's the same, the same color picker um, like before. We can make it transparent if we want, if we want to sort of slightly translucent dodecahedron. And then I can just add a text box and um, uh, we can make this a little bit smaller, maybe um, change the color to, uh, uh, to black and make it bold. And, uh, and then just use those text boxes to name uh, different vertices. So if I rotate it, the text boxes won't move with it. But if the goal is just to create a static version, you can uh, just manually add text boxes how um, how you want to uh, add um, how you want to label the vertices. Um, somebody has asked uh, about inserting mathematical equations, but that you already showed. Uh, yeah, uh, square root of x over two to the power of uh, four, uh, uh, whatever you want. All of that uh, should be uh, possible. Um, can we, uh, so uh, any user's guide to learn the software, but that you've already shared many resources. Yeah, um, click on the tutorial link here and we've got um, uh, sort of uh, filtered uh, the, these, these activities and tasks just for the tutorials. We've got a general introduction and then separate tutorials for all of the different um, tile types and, and sections. So if you want to learn just about the geometry tools that's in here, but a, a general introduction is, um, is on this page. And then the, the best way to learn, I guess, is just to go to um, the uh, events and uh, find the, uh, uh, maybe the, the back to school events are the best ones. They have all of the latest features and there's one for elementary, one for secondary and watch those recordings and they have um, uh, many more details. Uh, one more question on, uh... Can there be activities around pictographs and tally tables for primary uh, children for data handling? Um, yes. So um, uh, you can create your own pictograms and charts and activities in the canvas. Um, uh, uh, let's see what, what that would look like. So I, I'll go to the um, uh, probability and data section. Um, you can add a, let's zoom out a little bit, table with a chart. Um, uh, we have India, uh, China, um, USA, uh, UK, and uh, I don't know, 10, uh, 12, 14, 16. Uh, I don't know uh, what data this represents, but you can create a chart like this, maybe uh, have another one, 20, 18, uh, 16, 14. Um, you can uh, hide the table. So in fact, let's let's enable the advanced options here that I mentioned before and hide the table. So now we just have the chart and we can play around with this. So you can create a pictogram. 
you can also upload images. So in, in fact, um, um, emojis, um, I'll, I'll just, um, uh, I wonder if I find a good example. Well, you can, if you right click and um, copy image and then just paste it onto the canvas, you can paste images from anywhere on the web. You can also drag them, drag and drop them uh, from your desktop. If you want to add special images, um, maybe um, India flag, uh, we'll uh, uh, copy this, uh, paste it onto the canvas and, uh, and use those images to create nicer pictograms and illustrations. Um, you can lock all of this if you don't want students um, to mess with it. So now it's locked, I can't move it around, I can't interact with it. Um, but you can draw on top of it and sort of uh, point to special things, uh, highlight things, whatever. And uh, if you want to unlock any tiles, go to the settings menu again, and you can unlock all of the existing tiles and show them if you want to continue working with it um, as a teacher. So that I think covers most of the questions. Uh, so there is a question here. Uh, it's going up a bit fast. So I just, uh, uh, for instance, an ellipse gets converted to a circle if we rotate the table underneath. Why? I mean, is it possible to explain this? Um, I'm not quite sure what um, what you mean by that. Um, can you can you put some more more details in the chat, maybe? Yes, some. Uh, the, I think you can request. Uh, the question was from Manish. If you could rephrase your question, please. So also, uh, there's a question about: Is there a possibility to explore basic concepts of calculus, uh, functions, limits? Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, I've shown you all of the features so far, and it's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. Um, you can uh, use the uh, coordinate system, uh, uh, draw an equation, um, uh, y equals x squared minus 3x plus 2. Uh, maybe actually, let's make it x cubed. Um, draw it um, on here. Let's make this a different color and then uh, use the, uh, uh, maybe the, the, uh, the custom polygons to, uh, to create a sort of an approximation for, uh, um, uh, I didn't mean to delete that, uh, for, uh, for the area under the curve and, and, and use this uh, to introduce calculus. Um, all of the tools are available. It's kind of up to you uh, what you want to use them for. And, and the same goes for science as well. If um, uh, yes, uh, you can use, uh, in, in fact, we are working on some dedicated uh, physics tools and pulleys and, and levers and, um, and gears and stuff like that. But until then, uh, what you end up doing with those tools and what topics and subjects you want to use them for, that's completely up to you. So, so the DICE example, uh, for radioactive decay, for example, can be done in a physics lesson if, if you want to talk about carbon dating or, or something like that. Okay, wonderful. Uh, there's also a question about teacher training. So can, how can we access uh, teacher training? Uh, yeah, go to the For Teachers link, um, click on events and webinars, watch any of these recorded uh, um, workshops and, and, and webinars we have, or sign up for any of our upcoming events. Um, we also offer professional dedicated development. So if you if you are a head teacher and want to have a, an hour a workshop for all of the teachers in your school, you can book that with that with us. That would cost money. Um, uh, sort of all of the the um, open workshops and Mathigon and our mobile apps and so on. All of that is free to use. If you want to book a dedicated workshop just for your school, um, that uh, uh, we will charge money for. Great. So I think we've covered most of the questions. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, participants, we just have a few minutes more, another five minutes. Um, I, I saw some questions in the chat about um, 
circles and hyperbolic shapes. So the cut tool for polygons right now only works with straight lines. Um, so I can't cut um, along a curved shape. Um, maybe that's something we'll add in the future, but that is not currently possible. Um, for our 3D solids, um, there might be a few exceptions, but in general, we only support convex shapes um, rather than concave shapes. And again, those are only polyhedra. We don't yet support um, curved surfaces in our 3D engine like spheres or cylinders and cones. That is also um, something we might want to add in the future. Um, and uh, in terms of hyperbolic functions, uh, you can definitely draw them on the coordinate system if you um, uh, uh, write the equations. Um, in, in fact, this is an experiment. I don't remember if, if, um, if those are supported, but uh, yeah, hyperbolic functions are supported uh, in, the, in the graphing calculator here. So you can, um, you can definitely draw those. Um, we don't support music on the canvas. I'm, I'm not quite sure why that's something you would, uh, want to add, but uh, you, you can't add audio files or anything like that onto the canvas right now. Uh, is there a flexibility of changing the tools, uh, some kind of developer interface? So is there a possibility that somebody can add a new tool or you know, modify for their own purpose? Is that possible? Or? Um, we don't have a developer API at the moment. That's something we might work on in the future, but that's not available. Uh, but um, what I mentioned before, what you can definitely do is, um, I, I'll save this as a canvas just now. If you have a saved canvas, uh, you can um, create an embed code and embed this on other websites. And you can customize some things here. So um, for example, if you don't want to show the sidebar, you can hide it, in, hide it entirely. If you only want the, um, the move and the pen tools um, to be available in the toolbar, you can do that. You can hide the settings bar. You, <clears throat> you can prevent deleting or rotating tiles. And we generate an iframe snippet that you can copy and paste anywhere. And I'll just copy the URL part to show you what this would look like. So there's no sidebar. We've only shown two specific tiles. You can't rotate tiles anymore because we've disabled that. So there are lots of customizations just the, uh, from the general UI that, uh, that you can do there. Okay, I think that's... Uh, everyone is asking for a recording of this, which will be made available. And uh, so I think if there are no more questions, uh, we will, uh, the session, we will, the, the time is almost over. Uh, we didn't even realize how the 90 minutes went by. Yeah, well, so, um, I mean, there's a lot more to Mathigon if you're interested. Um, if, if you go to our homepage, um, uh, have a look at some of the other tools. We've got a really interesting timeline of mathematics that sort of explores how, um, uh, how uh, um, mathematics was developed over time and different discoveries and uh, sort of different um, mathematicians throughout history that, um, uh, that have made important discoveries. Um, we have lots of interactive courses for all sorts of uh, different topics, um, sort of the core curriculum, trigonometry, polygons, circles, but also more recreational mathematics. So we've got a course on graph theory, for example, where you can, uh, try to uh, draw a path um, through uh, Königsberg that crosses every bridge, but not more than once. So um, loads of interesting stuff to explore there. If you want to learn more, um, take a look at one of our um, back to school events that we just hosted a few weeks ago that uh, one hour long give a rough overview of all of the different features available on Mathicon. Go to our community forum and sign up if you have any specific questions and uh, yeah, um, send us uh, tweets or, or on, on Facebook messages if, uh, if uh, there's anything else uh, you want to know. Okay, so I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Philip, uh, on behalf of MTA and all, and all the participants present uh, for showing us this fascinating tool and, you know, which can really take math pedagogy to a completely different level. It offers tremendous flexibility, I think much more than real manipulative scans. So it is, I think, gone more 
uh, much beyond virtual manipulatives. Uh, it has given us a real concrete experience today, and you've taken us through all possible topics of tessellation, 3D and polyhedra algebra. Uh, we've explored, we've seen probability and randomness, statistics, graph fun, we've seen dynamic features, and also you've showed us how to uh, maybe get uh, more input, more resources on uh, through your to the site to the multigon.org site. So thank you so much for that brilliant session, and uh, we do hope to utilize it in what the best way we can. And uh, we hope we can interact, to continue to interact with you, maybe in, even as giving some suggestions as to what all can be added as we go along using it in our uh, teaching. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, if if people on your team want to help with translating the content into other languages, I think I. Um, I mentioned that Mathigon is available in more than 20 different languages, but uh, we always want to add more. Um, there might be uh, errors in some of the translations that, that we need to fix. If, if you have any other feedback or suggestions what we should add, please get in touch. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, over to you, Harita. If you want to. Thank you so much, Philip, for a really uh, wonderful and uh, comprehensive talk on Mathicon. Uh, I think all the teachers have enjoyed and all of them are asking for recordings, so we'll definitely share with them. Uh, now we will meet at 5.30 for Kenona's talk. Uh, so I request you to join at 5.30 and let's have a tea break at our respective places. <laughs> okay. Thank you once again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.